chapter 3, uh, and it seems like every time we have this, there's always somebody here who's not familiar with what we're doing. Uh, as a congregation, we are reading the same five chapters every day for a week. And so it's five chapters a week, and we read those same five chapters every day. And then, uh, it's usually on Wednesday, but because of our summer series, right now we're doing it on Sunday mornings, we get together and we talk about what we've been reading throughout the week. And so consequently, uh, trying to cover five chapters is impossible, so we hit some highlights. So if you're looking for an in-depth class and discussion, it, it won't be that so much. Uh, but what we've been reading is in-depth, and uh, so at the end of the year, which will be November for us because this is when we started it, Lord willing, we'll have read the Bible, the New Testament through uh, at least five times, uh, some seven times if you're reading it every single day. And so we're looking forward to, to knowing our Lord more because of what we've read, which brings us to chapter 3. But before we do that, remember the last half of chapter 2, and we didn't get to this last week, uh, Paul explained how the Gentiles are going to be fellow heirs with the Jews, uh, how that they were once were far off, but now they've been brought near because of the, the blood of Christ. And because of this, the Gentiles, this is verses 14 through 18, and the Jews are members of the same body. Now let me tell you something. <clears throat> this may not seem that impressive to us, but if we were living back in that day, for the Jews and the Gentiles uh, to even do anything together would have been amazing. Uh, they, they lived as, for as much as they possibly could completely separate from one another. Uh, there was one prayer that was offered by the Jews that really, it slams everybody it can except for a Jewish man. It says, God, I thank thee I was not born a slave, a Gentile, or a woman. <laughs> uh, so that, that just slams everybody except a Jew. But that was kind of the mindset, but especially when it came to the Gentiles. Remember when Jesus asked the Samaritan woman, which a Samaritan is half Jew, half Gentile. Yeah. Remember when he asked her for a drink, what was her response? Yeah, they, you, you guys don't normally talk to us. Yeah. I, I'm a Samaritan and I'm a woman, yeah. and here you are talking to us. You know, what gives with this? Uh, so she was shocked by that. And so when Paul says something like this, we can't, we can't just pass through this without paying attention that the Jews and the Gentiles can be members of the same body. And you know, we, throughout history, there's been uh, this challenge, not necessarily with Jews and the Gentiles, but you think about the history of the church. Uh, and if you go to different parts of the world, there, there's always lessons that we can learn from this. Uh, you know, you hear things like black churches and white churches. Uh, we're all members of one body. We, we, ought, to, we ought to demonstrate that it's our, our bond in Christ can get us to, to be together in any situation. Uh, in India, um, their arch enemy is Pakistan. <laughs> and the Pakistans feel the same way about Indians. Uh, but I've been to some congregations where Pakistans were worshiping, Pakistanis were worshiping with Indians. Uh, that doesn't happen in any other facet over there. Pakistanis can't have Indian jobs. And they're just... And if you go to Pakistan as an Indian, it's, it's the opposite of that. But here they can, they can worship together. And so here you have Jews and Gentiles in one body, and it's an awesome thing. We, we can't just run past that without paying some close attention to that. Uh, so they're members, they're fellow citizens with the saints, they're members of the household of God, chapter 2, verse 19. They are a holy temple in the Lord, a habitation of God in the Spirit. Now, we come to chapter 3, and I want us to notice something at the very beginning of this. And you, you can tell that Paul has prayer in mind, even as he starts chapter 3. Look at verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles. And then, I don't know, I'm using the New King James, but it's got a hyphen after that. It's kind of a parenthetical statement of what he's going to talk about. But then drop down to verse 14. He says, for this reason I, Paul, in verse 1, and then look at verse 14, for this reason 
I bow my knees to the Lord of our Lord Jesus Christ, to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he starts off, and then he makes some statements. And what does it cause him to do in verse 14? He hits his knees, so to speak, and prays to God. Um, there are times, and, and I hope that you've been doing this, or at least uh, the same feeling comes to you. As you're reading certain parts of the New Testament, as we've been reading it and reading it and reading it, have you been driven to prayer because of, of something that you've read? Something that just, man, I've got to thank God <laughs> for this. Chapter 3 is one of those chapters that ought to drive us to our knees and just thank God. And we're going to see what that is. Um, starting in chapter 3, starting with verses 1 through 5, there's a revelation of a mystery that's been revealed. Let's start reading. I know you've already read this several times this week. Let's read it again. Ephesians chapter 3, starting with verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery as I have briefly written already, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it has been now revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. A mystery that's been revealed. And you notice he talks about by the grace of God, this mystery was made known first to whom? To Paul. All right. So this mystery was revealed to him. And how did he receive the mystery? The answer, the revelation. Well, <laughs> the answer to the mystery. I just gave it away in the question. It was by revelation, wasn't it? Now, how then did he pass it on to the Ephesians and to us? What did he do? He wrote it down. He wrote it down. And then the Ephesians, what did they do? It's they, just, read it. they read it. That's right. So he received it supernaturally. He wrote it down. And then sent it to the Ephesians. The Ephesians read it. And now watch this. Verse 4. By which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So, you know what I know. You know what I know. Paul received it. He wrote it. We read it. And then what? We know what he knows. Now, I'll just let that sink in for just a second right there. We didn't receive it the same way Paul did. But we've received it, haven't we? And how have we received it here 2,000 years later? We're reading what they read. And we can understand this mystery. And that's, that's an awesome thing right there. That ought to be getting us in the direction of, of uh, hitting our knees. But it tells us some things that are very, very important here. Number one, how we came to understand this mystery by reading it. But then the second thing we can't overlook is that it's understandable. I received it by revelation. I wrote it down. You can read it, and not just read it, but you can understand. You can understand that. You know, there are things in the Bible that we love to think about, we love to discuss, we might even love to debate. Uh, we can, every single day, and we've seen this, haven't we? As we've been reading the New Testament several times a week, we learn something every time. I, I, you can read it five times, but the sixth time you'll think, huh, I've never noticed that before. <laughs> That's right. And so you, you continue to learn. But can we understand the Bible? Can we understand what God expects of us? Absolutely we can. That's right. If we can read or have somebody read it to us, we can. Having made known the mystery of His will. It's called a mystery because it was once hidden. At one time, it was hidden. The meaning was hidden. Um, and a mystery is called such not because it remains a mystery, but because 
That's what it was for so long in times past. It was a mystery. All right, God, what are you doing? What, what are your plans? Abraham wandering uh, and, and never having a, a place where he could just set down roots and stay. But what, what's, what's the deal here, God? Moses wandering in the wilderness, leading people to the promised land. Uh, what's, what's the plan here, God? What, what are you doing? The prophets prophesying things. What's the meaning of this? Where, where are you going with this? It was a mystery. But now let me ask you this. Um, is it still a mystery? Now, you, either way you answer this, you're going to be okay. <laughs> let me ask you this. What kind of books, I'm going to show my, my reading age level here right now, but uh, the Hardy Boys, what kind of genre are they? You know the Hardy Boys? It's mystery. How many here have read the Hardy Boys or Nancy Drew? Okay, I'll, I'll leave Nancy Drew for you ladies there. It was Hardy Boys or nothing for me. The ladies might have been Nancy Drew. But we call them mystery books. Even though you've read them and you know the answer to the mystery, what kind of books are they still? They're mysteries. They're mysteries. And so Paul is talking about a mystery but it's a mystery that's been revealed. It's not like we're still here wondering today in, in 2020. Well, I wonder, I wonder what, well, we know. We know what the mystery is. But its reason it's called a mystery because it remained unrevealed for so long. He has made known the mystery of his will. Look at verse, um, verses 6 through 9. That the Gentiles, here it is, should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel of which I became a minister according to the gift of grace of God to me by the effective working of his power to me who am less than the least of all saints this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make us or to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ. So it was called a mystery because it was once hidden, but now it's been revealed. And what is the mystery that it's been revealed? We, we just read it. The church. And what specifically is he talking about concerning the church? The Gentiles and the Jews, all of them, in one body. Now, now think about this. If it would have been, uh, you know, 2,000 years ago, and we, we talked a little bit about the animosity between Jews and the Gentiles that was there. <clears throat> and you can almost see how this, uh, how this would have been easier. It would have been wrong, but it would have been easier. Okay. Jews might think, all right, you know, we've been the chosen people in our own mind for all these years, for 2,000 years. So now these Gentiles, we're being told we have to accept them, that they are, they are one with us. We have to accept them. So let's just do this the easiest way we possibly can. We'll have the Jewish Church of Christ and the Gentile Church of Christ. So the Jews, you, you go over here to building A, and the Gentiles, you go over here to building B. Yeah, we'll acknowledge, because we have to, that you're all one in us, but let's just keep separate. Would that have made some things easier, you think? In some ways it would have, but what would have been the problem with that? They weren't one. <laughs> no, they wouldn't have been one. They would have still been separated. There would have been a middle wall of partition still between them. And you read um, chapters and, and, and verses like Acts chapter 13, verse 1, when you read about the church in Antioch and you see the list of people that are in that congregation. You've got a former persecutor of, of Christians, Saul of Tarsus, a, a Jew. You've got Barnabas. Uh, you've got Greek-speaking people, uh, Grecian names, Lucius. Uh, uh, you have royalty mentioned in that chapter and you have commoners mentioned in that verse and they were all members of the same congregation the church 
should be the place, the one place in society where that bond in Christ erases all of the other societal things that divide. Race, money, popularity, power, we're all one in Christ. To be a place where everybody is welcome and everybody is loved just the same. Now, we see in the New Testament that it wasn't always like that. They struggled with it just like we struggle today, don't we? Uh, James had to write them, listen, <laughs> you, got, you got a poor person in here, you don't, you don't give him any honor, that rich person comes in, oh, come up here and have a seat right here in the front, you know, we're going to take care of you, and, and he, he condemned them for it. This should not be. But the church should be the place it's that one body where the glory of God is seen. And what's the glory of God? Is, is, is God a respecter of persons? No. That's right. And if we want to be like Christ, what's that mean about us? We're not a respecter of persons either. It's a powerful thing that we're all in one body. I mean, it's... it's, it's the revelation is that he planned the church before the foundations of the earth were begun, but also that all men can be a part of her. We can't miss that part of it. And it's a beautiful part of it. And then he says this. Uh, he begins to explain it a little bit more, involves the Gentiles. Uh, but look at uh, verse 8 again. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints... This grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Paul mainly went to the Gentiles, didn't he? Now, it doesn't mean he didn't preach to Jews because he still did a lot of that too. But mainly went to the Gentiles. And to make, verse 9, all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Therefore I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you which is your glory. So his job, go to the Gentiles, and as that, his task was to preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. I know that we talk about this, and it seems like every chapter or every Sunday that we're together or Wednesday, whatever the case may be, but we, we look at those descriptive, qualifying words. If he would have said to preach unto you the riches of Christ, that's good still, but what word does he put before that? The unsearchable riches of Christ. If you start thinking, even though the mystery has been revealed, but if you start thinking about the riches that are in Christ, when will you have come, so okay, now I conclude, I've contemplated every single richness that comes in Christ Jesus. When will you be able to say that? Even if I live to be 99 and I think about it every day, it just grows, doesn't it? It grows. The unsearchable riches of the Christ. Um, number two, his job was to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ, but number two, to make all people see what is the fellowship of the mystery, verse 9, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which was from the beginning of the ages, has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. The fellowship of the mystery. What's that mean? Mm -hmm. Being one. When God made the promise to Abram in Genesis chapter 12, uh, how many nations did he say would be blessed? All nations. When God made his covenant with Moses, who was that covenant with? Moses and who? The Israelites. And only the Israelites. 
What was God's plan all along? Was it just to select a certain group of people? No, it's always been that all men could come to Him. Um, and this wisdom, in the next place, the third place, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known. And how is it going to be made known? There in verses 10 through 12. To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known how? By the what? Church. By the church, to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed or accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. How can the church help show the manifold wisdom of God? Paul wrote to Timothy, and he preaching it. Preaching it. When he, Paul wrote to Timothy, he talked about the church, and he called it something. The pillar and ground of what? Of the truth. Of the truth. It's made known by the church. This wisdom of God is being made known to principalities and powers in the heavenly places, not just to Gentiles, but all the people and even spiritual entities are being enlightened. Remember when Peter wrote? He talked about, let's turn there, 1 Peter chapter 1. <laughs> this, this, this is leading us to understand why Paul hit his knees coming up. <laughs> Look at 1 Peter chapter 1. We, we need to understand and appreciate what we've already read, let's see, we started reading Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I don't know if you've done your reading today at least three times. If you've done your reading already this morning, you've already read this four times, and I know you've read it in previous times in your life. But we need to appreciate what we just read, what we're reading this week. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1. Talking about salvation. Of course, it's all together. The manifold wisdom of God. 1 Peter chapter 1, starting with verse 10. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Who knows you more? Now, now, now think about this. I know this almost sounds sacrilegious. But who's in a better position, you or, or Isaiah? While well, he was on the earth anyway. But what do you have that Isaiah didn't have? or Jeremiah, or Daniel. Now, all these people are people of God. Don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. But what do you get to enjoy in this life? Salvation. What's that? All the revelation. All those things that they were talking about that were going to be fulfilled, all of those things that they didn't fully understand themselves. What do you know? Oh, this is what Isaiah was talking about. This is what Daniel was talking about. When Daniel was talking about a kingdom that would never be destroyed, this is what he was talking about. And not only that, I get to be a member of it. <laughs> I get to be a member of it. Daniel spoke about that kingdom. Was he ever a member of that kingdom while he was on this earth? No. But here we get to be. Isn't that awesome? And then it goes on, I didn't finish reading there, let me just paraphrase, of things the angels have desired to look into. You know, we always talk about angels, the mysterious angels. What are they doing today? Are they doing anything? What have they done in the past? What were the angels wanting to know about? The salvation that we've received. <laughs> That's pretty awesome, isn't it? Making known the wisdom of God through the church. And then look at verse 12. In whom we have boldness. And watch. And access. And watch. With confidence through faith in Him. Going back to Ephesians 3 now, verse 12. We have boldness. 
You know, we've got a little chihuahua dog that walks all over Mindy. I mean, that dog gets anything she wants from Mindy uh, because she knows Mindy <laughs> is a softy when it comes to that thing. And so she'll go right up there and she'll jump on Mindy's lap, you know, all the time. If Mindy sits down, that dog's on her lap, I mean, a split second later. That dog, to me, will come to where I'm sitting and will just sit there and look at me. And just look at me. And, you know, if I look down at her sometimes, she'll even do that. And I've never beat that dog and I never would. But there's just a difference. She knows, you know. Now, if I smile at her, she'll jump on my lap. <laughs> but if I don't smile, she will not. Mindy, doesn't matter what the look on her face is, that dog's getting on her lap. And there'll be no consequences because of it. If you think about this, when we approach the throne of God, when you think about His majesty, and His power, and His holiness, and His perfection, what would you think should be our disposition in coming to Him? I don't, I'm, not, I'm not talking to Him. <laughs> I, I, I'm not talking to Him. You, you go talk to Him. We can do it with boldness. And that doesn't mean that we approach Him, well, God, boy, you're lucky to hear from me today. That's, that's not what we're talking about. And it's not, you know, popping our suspenders as we approach Him. But we can approach Him and not have to worry about being rejected, for being scolded for coming to Him. We can come to Him with boldness. Think about that. And confidence. That's awesome. And then watch, through faith, in Him. Therefore I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulation for you, which is your glory. And then verse 14, for this reason I bow my knees. I'll tell you something. As we read this throughout the week and we think about this, the things that are ours, man, we need to be thanking God for, don't we? I get to be a member of the kingdom that never fades away. I get to be a member of the kingdom that shows the manifold wisdom of God. I get to be a member of the kingdom that includes all people. It's not a respecter of persons. You can't get a fair shake on this earth in any other realm except the family of God. And I get to be a member of that family where people love me, where people care for me. I get to be a member of that kingdom. And I get to know about it. I get to understand it from the beginning all the way to the end. I get to understand it. Things that the prophets wanted to know more about, things that the angels desired to look into, I get to know it. It's been revealed, it's been written, I can read it, and I can understand it. And again, it's, it's, it's not a cocky thing to my hey, I'm a member of the church, I'm something special. It ought to drive us to our knees. Thank you, God, for the grace that made it possible. Are you thankful for the church? Let's pray and thank God for it together right now. Let's pray. Our Father, we are grateful that we get to be a member of the kingdom of Christ, that we get to experience and understand the price that was paid for our souls. We live on this side of the cross. We're so fortunate. Those people under the old law that would offer their sacrifices, that would never give them full forgiveness, the blood of bulls and goats, we are told, cannot take away sin. Father, we know that through their faithfulness to that law, the salvation that is ours in Christ was also theirs because of the ultimate sacrifice. Father, what a privilege it is to understand it, to 
see this mystery revealed and to read it for ourselves and to understand the price that was paid for our full salvation, for our full forgiveness. We're grateful. And Father, we pray that we will be a part of showing the wisdom of you to this world by, by our actions, by the way we act, by the way that we think, by the way that we talk, by the way we love other people. Father, help us to show the world what it's like to be in Christ. Forgive us, Father, for those times that we're not. Like Paul, we're driven to our knees in, in prayer and thanking, thanking you for this wonderful privilege, God. And I can't put it into words, just what's on our hearts. But Father, we pray that you'll search our hearts and see what we mean. Father, this morning we're just grateful. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Paul prays, verses 14 and 15. You notice, and we won't talk much because I want to get to chapter 4 in the 10 minutes we have left. Uh, his posture in prayer, it says, I bow the knee. Well, he may have or he may not have. When we say we bow the knee, uh, that's not necessarily talking about a physical posture. You can bow your knee when you pray. Um, other people have done other things. There's no official posture. Solomon stood when he prayed in the temple, 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 22. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, David sat before the Lord, 1 Chronicles 17, verse 16. What did Jesus do in Gethsemane? What was his prayer posture? Fell flat on the ground, didn't he, and prayed. Uh, it's not our posture necessarily physically, but it's the posture of our heart that, that matters. And so Paul says, I bowed the knee, he addressed God the Father, uh, and that's a beautiful prayer. Let's, let's read it, and then we'll go on to chapter 4. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend... <laughs> With all the saints, what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge? Did you see something there that you may be able to comprehend? But then what does he say? It passes all knowledge. That goes back to what we're talking about. We get it, but the more we study, the longer we live, we'll get it more, won't we? We'll continue to get it more, just what it means, the love of Christ. Verse 20, now to him who is able to exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Again, look at those descriptive words. Take them out and you read it and it's still awesome. Now to him who is able to do all that we ask or think. <laughs> but what does he say? Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Well, one of the biggest problems and biggest mistakes we can make is planning too small. And I know this has to be, uh, well, I know it is a challenge because I used to be one. It's a challenge for an eldership. Uh, you know, you're planning and you think, well, my plans are big. But he's able to do even much more than, than we can plan. And so our plans, our vision has to be even beyond our own selves. And that's, that's a challenge, isn't it? Uh, let's go to chapter 4. There's so much more there, but this is one we need to hit, uh, at least briefly. Chapter 4, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another, in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called, and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And so we understand this. We've read this, I know, several times. Um, walking together in unity. And... We probably are very familiar, you know, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father, and, and, and we've known those. But I want us to just, sometimes these are the things that we miss because we, we, we love, and we, we've even done a lectureship before on, on one body where, where I was, the Upon the Rock lectureship. We did an entire lectureship on, on verses 4 through, through 6, <laughs> 
one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and on all of that. We did a whole lectureship on that because that's what we usually focus on. But I want us to see the attitudes that have to be there in order for there to be unity of the Spirit, the bond of peace. Notice, first of all, he says, verse 2, with all lowliness, lowliness. Uh, having a humble opinion of yourself, of oneself, a deep sense of one's littleness, modesty, humility, lowliness of mind. Why do you think that's an important characteristic to have if there's going to be unity? Why is that number one, perhaps, on the list? All of these are just as important. Why must lowliness, a humble opinion about yourself, to understand your littleness? What do you think? Why do you think that's such an important... If we're going to have unity, why does there have to be lowliness? We're looking at the characteristics that promote unity. Why must we all have a humble opinion of ourselves? What's that? That's right. If, if I think... Well, Mark Reynolds, and you know, those listening on the outside right now, I always think when I say things like this, what are they going to think? So I'll use Jeremy Beard. If Jeremy Beard thinks, <laughs> boy, I am the start and the finish of this church. You know, if I wasn't here, <laughs> it's just going to fall apart. And man, these people around here better do whatever it takes to make me happy. Does that promote unity? No, <laughs> that, that destroys it, doesn't it? But instead, this is the attitude Jeremy really has, what can I do to help other people? Their needs are more important than my own. Does that promote unity? Lowliness. Gentleness. Let's define this word. Gentleness, mildness, meekness. Uh, it's not a quality of weakness, but it's power under control. Uh, Moses was a man who was, was the meekest, but he was capable of great things, wasn't he? And strength and boldness. Jesus was meek and lowly in spirit. But what did he accomplish? It's being gentle. Even when there's poten potential for being harsh, be gentle. Be gentle talking with a, with a man that uh, this past weekend that's got a, a difficult task ahead of him and, and others um, who are in the wrong. And they've said some things that just well, can make you angry. And the temptation is to go into this meeting they're going to have and, boy, I'm just going to let them have it. <laughs> I'm just going to let them have it. But being gentle, even in those circumstances, because you let them have it, and you might put them in their place and shame them like they need to be shamed, but what's your ultimate goal? If there's going to be unity, what are you trying to accomplish? Trying, that's right. You're trying to get them to repent, to see the error of their way. And so we'll all still be one. We'll all still be one. And so we handle those things even when it takes, all right, we're going to have to be direct. We're going to have to say some things that are going to hurt this person's feelings because they may not even see it. But we've got to do it in a way that to let them know that we still love you. We want what's best for you. We don't want to just hurt you by the things that we say. We're trying to help your soul. There's a gentleness. There's a gentleness that is there. Long-suffering. The idea is one of patience, forbearance, long-suffering, slowness in avenging wrongs. Oh, boy. <laughs> slowness in avenging wrongs. That's an easy one, isn't it? If I say something to you right now that hurts you, what do you want to say right back? <laughs> something that hurts me, right? Long-suffering is that idea of, of slowness and avenging wrong. When the body consists of members who are not perfect, and we're not, none of us in this building are, 
We are complete in Christ, but none of us is sinlessly perfect. And so when you have a body of people who are not perfect, it's going to take long suffering, isn't it? Bearing with one another in love. We'll have to close here because they're getting ready to ring the bell. But let me, my mom uh, said something a few weeks ago, last time, well, the time before last when we were up in Indiana, so I guess it's been a couple months ago, that stuck with me. And bearing with one another in love. You think about with your own family. Have your children ever hurt you? And they've hurt you probably more than anybody else could hurt you. Wouldn't you say? Do you still? That's right, because, because you love them. But when they did, did you just throw them? Well, well, I had a daughter once, but not anymore. You hurt me. That was your chance. You blew it. No. And then my mom said this. She said, even if I knew one of my grandchildren was, going to, was planning my murder, <laughs> I would still love them. Because they're family. That's the type of love we're striving to have for one another in the church, isn't it? The reason we're so quick to forgive our family is because, why? We love them. And the reason, oftentimes, where I'm not willing to forgive my brother in Christ is because I don't love him. Love Him like I should. God help us to work towards that type of love. Because if we have it, man, unity is achievable, isn't it? Alright, we're out of time. Greg's looking at me. I went too long. Appreciate it. Let's get ready to worship God. Uh, he deserves our best. Especially after what we've just studied. You ready to worship Him and tell Him thank you? Let's give Him our best.